All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate you all taking the time out of your busy schedules. Welcome to NIST 800-171, What You Need to Know When the DOD Calls, by Braintrace, a live webinar hosted by Kate Riley. My name is Nick Cook. I'm the Director of Marketing at Braintrace. We'll be taking questions at the end of this presentation. We'll also send out a link to download the webinar tomorrow. Before I hand this over to Kate, I'd like to give a brief description of Braintrace. Braintrace is a premier managed security service provider our state-of-the-art Security Operations Center, or SOC, is equipped with leading technology and top industry talent, providing our customers 24-7, 365 network monitoring and cybersecurity protection. Now, the person you've all been waiting for, and someone who really, really, really enjoys talking about this subject, the Director of Information Security and Compliance for Braintrace, Kate Riley. Take it away, Kate. Thank you, Nick. Welcome, everyone. I'm really glad that we're all here to talk about auditing. Just a little bit about me. I've been an auditor on the federal, state, and local and industry side, as well as being audited by federal, state, and local and industries. And I bring all of that background here in helping you get ready for an audit, how an auditor looks at their um, program and what is involved in getting ready for it. So today we're going to walk through why NIST 800-171 is here and why it's here to stay. What is involved in 800-171? Because that connects us to all of the audit parts here. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on what auditors uh, view data, what their requirements are, and how they audit, as well as what is audit evidence and how to prepare for an audit. We're going to look at NIST 800-171 evidence versus the audit review. I think that's the part that most organizations struggle with. And a bonus section here is if you aren't quite ready for NIST 800-171, we have a seven-step guide just to get you ready for that. So let's get started. So why is NIST 800-171 here? We know that it's for federal um, contractors and subcontractors. We know that it's looking at those security dependencies, but I'm gonna go back in history here just a little bit. Because NIST 800-171 mirrors what happened in 2005 with the credit card industry. Back in 2005, they sat down and said, where are our risk exposures? And they realized it wasn't that people were hacking into the actual credit card companies and stealing credit cards. That theft was happening at the merchant site. And so they said, you know what? We have all of these dependencies on our merchants for security, but without any requirements for those merchants to install security. And so when you look on the graph here, you're going to see that gray section here, and that's that ripple effect of dependencies. And that mirrors what the DOD had to do. They said, look, inside our four borders, we've got strong security controls and definition of those controls. But when we subcontract out to contractors and they subcontract to subcontractors, that's the same ripple effect. And so what was outside their control didn't have a definition for what security requirements were needed for a minimum baseline security. And so NIST 800-171 was developed and designed and, of course, is now being implemented to manage what those credit card companies were doing then. And what we see here in 800-171 is on the top right corner, we see that DFARS is in that description and FAR is in there. And that's for that controlled, unclassified information, also called CUI. And it relates to the non-federal organizations. And so it's a very specific population that has to comply with NIST 800-171. But what you'll also notice is that it's based on NIST 853. And that's a security and control framework that NIST is already out there. And you're probably familiar with some of those pieces. But what I want us to connect to is that it is not including ISO 27002 and not including the NIST cybersecurity framework. What's interesting is that if we go back to our history lesson, this follows exactly what was happening with those credit card companies. When the credit card companies wanted those merchants to improve their security, they couldn't really mandate it, right? I mean, a merchant can choose to go to a different credit card or a bank. They don't have to use that specific credit card. And so the industry put together a voluntary program that says, here is our guidelines for security. Please voluntarily implement it and report back to us on your security health and requirements. And what we're hearing in 2019 is that that NIST Cybersecurity Framework is a voluntary program right now. 
but soon it's probably going to be incorporated just like the NIST 853 is incorporated. So we're going to see some patterns in what happens with how audit programs come into organizations, worlds, and universes and becomes a staple. It's there to stay, so to speak. So what do we have in this 8171? Well, we have 14 categories and 110 controls. These controls are probably pretty familiar. If you've ever done any kind of security framework or program, you've seen something very similar to this. These 14 categories aren't necessarily unknown. But what is unique to NIST 800-171 is the two documents that the government is looking for. That's your system secure plan and your plan of actions and milestones. And those are the key deliverables that are a requirement to report back up. And much like that, merchant credit card relationship. It's that self-assessment voluntary activity at this stage of the game. But as we can see, it's soon going to become an industry requirement. So let's just get into it. Let's talk about audits. Okay, what an audit procedure is and how an auditor has to review evidence. There are seven categories that they are actually able to use in any combination to get what we call a comfort of the control is in place and working effectively. So the first one is pretty straightforward, right? They're going to inquire, but what's involved in that, right? That's that first meeting that says, you know, walk me through how you, you know, organize NIST 800 171. Walk me through those 14 categories. Talk to me about what you're doing and what you're not doing. That inquiry is just that data discovery, the background. It's not actually evidence, but it's part of how they get an understanding of what's going on. Another tool for an auditor is to actually observe the control itself. Literally sit down with your system administrator, watch them log on to your system, watch them input the script to actually export out the data, and they're observing not only how your system engineer understands the system, but they're also validating how data is actually collected. There's something um, very powerful in watching a control in place and working. Another observation is very similar to that is inspection, where they go on site and they actually look at, if you're talking about a physical control, right? They're looking at the building, they're seeing the camera, they're seeing fire suppression, they see the actual lock. Uh, inspection can also be of documentation. They're not just um, observing that you have a process, but they inspect the actual documentation or even the outputs of it. Inspection is also watching the quality control of maybe an actual product at the end of the line. So inspection has a lot of different variables in it. There's also a procedure. So auditors look not just in terms of a, a document procedure, right? We call policies and procedures, but from an audit point of view, the procedure is actually step-by-step -step activities that they are actually inspecting, observing, or reviewing. And so they actually might go through an actual procedure uh, as part of their audit review evidence. An auditor may recalculate. That's where they take all of your source inputs separately. And even though you might have had a system that took those data inputs and came up to say a final calculation, they reperform that or they actually recalculate it so that they're coming to the same conclusion that you came to. They also do a confirmation. This one's kind of interesting. This is where if you had a third party, they might actually go out to the third party and inquire and observe and inspect there and say, hey, how did their parent company or how did your contractor uh, set up and just and you know, define these uh, rules and regulations, or do you have any reporting requirements to them? So they're going outside of your immediate process and procedure and getting confirmation that you're doing things as you say that you do. And then of course, an auditor can re-perform. We see a lot of this, right? You put all the data together and you hand it to the auditor and they'd look at you and they go, nope, we're gonna start from scratch and re-perform all of this. So what an auditor is doing in re-performance is, they're actually what we call validating that your process is consistent. So if somebody else comes in and redoes or reperforms your process, it comes to the same data output or same conclusion. So that's an important thing to realize is that that audit procedure has a lot of moving parts. 
And oftentimes when you are audited, that's the hard part is because you thought, well, I told them everything. I gave them all the documentation and they're still coming back with wanting to see something, they want to come on site now, or they're going out to your third parties and vendors and bugging them. And it's all of this, you know, time and material and, and discussion with this auditor. And it just seems like it's, it's a lot of time. And it seems like, where's the, why isn't the auditor getting this? You know, it's, do they not understand what I told them? You know, it's hard to really understand why an auditor is going through so many processes and procedures in an audit review. But this gives you that understanding that they could go through all seven of those um, audit procedures for the audit evidence or one or two. And that's the other fun part. There's, there's no one way to be audited and each auditor may have a different uh, requirement for what they're actually supposed to audit to get a level of comfort for. So that's why it can be very different from each experience and different audit topics as well, right? Um, the, the more high risk or the more high impact, the auditor may go to more extensive audit extents, right? They're gonna um, do a lot of testing, right? They're not just going to take, say, your word for it and review a document. And now we get into what is the evidence, the actual evidence itself. And an auditor has to have evidence that is relevant and reliable. And relevant information is very difficult for people who have never been audited before to understand what it is, but really it's that the piece of paper or the, uh, the procedure they observed or whatever they inspected is coming directly from the source that generated it or as close to that as possible. So that's why if you have a system engineer and he prints out the report and he hands it to the auditor, the auditor doesn't know that it actually was generated from that system because they didn't see that. There may be nothing on that piece of paper or Excel spreadsheet that's emailed to them that identifies the system that it came from. So without direct evidence, it actually isn't relevant to that control. So that's an example where the auditor might want to inquire, how do you generate this report? And then observe your engineer input in the script, watch the script run, watch that output be saved to an Excel file, actually watch the engineer like upload it to a secure file. And then the auditor has assurance that that evidence came directly from the system. And it wasn't modified from the moment it was generated to the moment the auditor received it in their hands. And that's getting to that over or understated evidence, right? So you can go understating a control, and that's just a um, inquiry. I don't actually have any direct evidence, but I've inquired, and maybe I observed, but I didn't take the output. So that's understating a control. And overstating a control is where you've looked at it from um, upstream and downstream processes, as well as how those, uh, the auditor identified that that control was sufficient. And those are the tricky parts about um, being audited is you're not sure how to evidence some of the information in your procedures, right? You're like, hmm. And you just have to be prepared that an auditor will ask first, most likely, how does this get generated or what source did this come from? And if the evidence itself doesn't have enough information, the auditor has to keep coming back and back and back until there's uh, enough of the story, if you will, around that control. If it's not in direct evidence, then they have to um, either overstate it, they have to look at you know, upstream and downstream processes that support it, or they might have to do additional testing. And the timing of information is also incredibly uh, important. So if you have a, a procedure like user access reviews and you do them manually and you do them uh, in the fourth quarter of the year so that they're done by December, but you kick them off, say, in November, well, the auditor may not come on site until July of the next year. So that's a six-month gap. Now, while it's an annual process and you hand them your, your last year's user access review, they go, thank you. And they may reperform it because within six months, they want to now validate that your process is consistent. Not just that every year you do that, but throughout the year, there's consistency in, for example, uh, provisioning and deprovisioning users. So while you have a process, it's evident and you handed it over, the auditor still might say, you know what, from a timeliness thing, I need to validate it now. 
data can get stale, right? As you imagine, um, you output to an Excel file. The moment you did that, you know, the nature of uh, systems and processes is that they change. And so things are going to happen in the data set they are no longer on that output that you handed to the auditor. That's another thing about timing. While, you know, at the beginning of the audit, you gave them all that evidence. And then about two or three months later, they come back and they ask for an, a late output. You know, just, just give us your current one on that. And that's a timeliness question where they're looking for consistency in how your control is evident. So reliability, this is a, another one where the auditor has to obtain that evidence, you know, uh, either through inquiry, observation, inspection, or a procedure, and they have to look at the nature and the source of that evidence, just as we talked about that, if it's relevant. Now, for example, here is if you forward them an email because you're documenting your management meetings in email. Now, an email is an editable document, if you think about it, before I forward it over to the auditor, I can just change the content here or add recipients or remove recipients. And so it's not reliable evidence because the nature of that email is editable. And the source of the evidence is an email rather than, say, meeting minutes or a recording or something that is less likely to be modified. They also look at how an organization stores their documentation. Again, it may not be reliable because somebody may edit, change, or even delete uh, information. And so what we'd say in the industry is that you trust but verify. So you're like, okay, you do that in email. I trust you. You're telling me this. Now show me that. And if, can you imagine an auditor coming back and saying, prove to me that that email wasn't modified. And that becomes a very difficult thing when you look at how evidence of your processes in your business process is occurring. And you start to realize, you know what, maybe email isn't the best, uh, you know, repository, if you will, for keeping track of our communications with our vendors or third suppliers. Or um, when we get to NIST 800-171, proving that CUI isn't in your email content. Woo, that gets to be harder and harder to do uh, because of, again, whether or not your evidence is reliable. And at the end of the day, evidence has to support the auditor's conclusion, and it's an incredible responsibility that an auditor has when they come to a conclusion. They have to conclude that you have a control, that's the description, the policy, the procedure, or the workflow. Uh, they have to see that it's in place, right? It's been implemented, either a system you know, configuration setting, or if we think of a workflow, right? A ticket request, test, develop, and then go live. And then it's working as intended. And that gets into how does an organization know when the control is not working and how do they know that the control is working? Because at the end of the day, the auditor is simply validating what you should already be have in place and that you say, yep, I know that, you know, we have users provisioned within 24 hours and I know if we miss that deadline, they're just revalidating what you say is your control process that's happening. So my advice to you is kind of put on your own little hotted hat and validate your own controls. When you look at your NIST 800-171 program, go to your system secure plan and really try to reperform it. Actually, you know, say to yourself, yeah, where is this stored? Is that, you know, are we actually doing a lot of communication in email? And if I needed to say that that email wasn't modified in some way, could I? Right? You just have to realize how an auditor has to figure out your control story because they're not in your, you know, your daily processes. They don't know your stakeholders. They don't know how that all works. And so when they're that objective to it, you start to realize why an auditor has to go to such lengths and asking for so much information because it may not be in the actual direct evidence or it may not be reliable evidence since that's that over and understating activity that they're, they're challenged with. So let's look at 800 and ask ourselves what kind of pieces of evidence um, are expected. So the first one is the definition. If we have covered information systems, it's important to realize that that's unclassified information. It's a system that's owned or operated by or for a contractor that processes, stores, or transmits covered defense information. Now, What's really funny to me or interesting is that this is almost the same language that those credit card companies did back in 2005. You just take out covered defense information and put back in 
credit card information. Oh, this also reminds me of HIPAA. Take out cover defense information and put in patient information. It is the same mechanism. You're looking for security around a data point that how is it processed, stored, or transmitted. And that's a really important first step with NIST 800-171. As an organization, you are now identifying logical and physical boundaries around an exact data type controlled unclassified information. So you're having to now say a clean room that has that controlled unclassified information and what we're gonna call dirty, which is anything else. And now that you have that perspective that your organization has two sides of the house and yet some business processes, particularly support processes, have to cover both sides of that house. For example, how do you set up your management of all of those systems? How do you prove what is in scope for CUI and out of scope for CUI? Take HR. A new user is provisioned, and it looks like their job role is to do CUI. They're going to handle CUI. All right, so HR now has to classify that user from day one in that system throughout its life cycle so that you manage and ensure that that resource and everything they touch stays in that clean room side of the house. And now you have to prove that nothing they do, physically or logically, goes into the non-clean side of the house. This is complexity that gets born into how you're managing your systems. And that gets into definition and classification and then, of course, controls around it. So your business processes are going to have to be clear about what is you know, contractually related, your subcontractors, just like that NIST cybersecurity being voluntary, we already have rumors coming up that contractors are actually responsible for their subcontractors' information security, that ripple effect. So it's all in how you're managing all of those relationships. You need to be clear about how you're managing uh, the flow down agreements. If they have a hint of CUI, they are in scope. So it's being really clear about it, classified, how it's labeled throughout all of your documentation. And now think about what we're talking about. We're not talking about a system secure plan, you know, specifically when we talk about management. We're talking about how your organization has procedures and processes to manage everything. And when a data point, a resource, a system, a, a, an access point includes CUI, there's a workflow that shows how it's segregated logically and physically, managed and monitored, and of course, evidenced. So it's being prepared for how you're tracking all of that internally and of course, externally to those other relationships and dependencies that a contractor may have. And of course, the thing about evidencing NIST 800-171 is that system secure plan and that plan of action and milestone. Now, my tip for you on the system secure plan is think about it, right? These are those 14 controls and, uh, and 110 actual control areas. And you might have a lot of sensitive information listed in there, and rightly so. This is your management of those controls. But you want to also say, you know what, we just don't hand that list of everything, the key star kingdom, I like to say, over to anybody that asks for it, even if it was an office of inspector general coming and knocking on your door and asking for your SSP. So you might also think strategically about how you sanitize that as external evidence so that you have an internal full breadth um, document, but if an auditor is asking for it, you just mask or, or, or demark in some way some of those sensitive pieces of information. And I also like to say, don't just like throw that over the fence to the auditor, equip them with that. Look, we're happy if you're on site, you can read it all to your heart's content. We just don't allow that document to leave our borders. Or if you want to, we can pull it up on screen and you can read through it. But once again, we don't just actually as a deliverable give you something that is so sensitive. And it's important to realize that you can treat your evidence that way as well. If an auditor is inspecting it, that's great, but they don't necessarily have to take it with them. And so you can work out some of that with your auditor when you get this huge documentation request list with how to fill it out. Your plan of action and milestones is a really important uh, 
it's like your risk management strategy. It's how you're getting information onto your plan of action and milestones, evidencing you're managing that, right? So assigning it to a task to be remediated, validating remediation took care, and then, you know, that timeliness of it, right? So how are things getting onto the list? How are things ex being executed and getting off the list? And as you can imagine, it's a living document. It's constantly happening, right? It should, you should be constantly reviewing risks and managing activities to it. So it's a really key document that the auditor gets to give them a perspective of how well is this organization managing CUI. And the other thing here is even we're going to go into the slide that digs into the SSP and POEM in just a minute. But Really think about it though, on this slide we're talking about, this is your whole organization, not just the cooey slice of the pie. So that your SSP can be clear about the boundaries between clean room and, and all of the cooey related stuff. And you can also put in there what your controls are that ensure nothing is outside the clean room, right? Because keep in mind that auditor has to read that and say, okay, how is this organization ensuring that nothing is in the non cooey side of the world? And I'm just gonna pause here also and let you know that an auditor has to look at both sides. They have to go to the non cooey side of the world and investigate that nothing cooey is in it. How are they gonna do that? Well, they might have to plug into your network and look at all your systems and get a sense of what the controls are and validate and test them so that they can have an assurance that this organization has two sides of the house Kui and non kui and it's really clear how the controls are managed on both sides of the house because it's what I call you can't be a little bit pregnant. You're in kui and you're a resource and you walk out. How do you make sure that you're not walking into the to the non kui side of the house and holding something that's left around, right? You have this incredible finesse of making sure that nothing gets to either side of the house. So let's look a little bit closer at the plan of action and milestones. Now, the template that's out there that's provided is the screen print that you see below here. And it has really good kind of guidance for it. My tip to you is make sure it's clear. What you're writing in those buckets is really clear. That it's current, as you can imagine, and auditors making sure that it's a living document. It's not just, you know, put together for the auditor's sake, but it's actually something that you as an organization rely on and that it's complete. Um, my tip here is that you'll notice on our example here that something was scheduled to be completed on March 1, 2019, but they're gonna ask for that evidence and it's, you know, right now it's March 28th. So you can imagine an auditor has to follow up with a question. Well, what happens if things are late? You know, do you just change the date on completion so things can just have a different date but never actually get done? Who's responsible for this? How does something get on here? What is the process around managing um, activities that, uh, uh, you know, you, you made a, a change to it, but it's not effective? Or again, this is all about managing your risks, those weaknesses, right? So what is your strategy around managing the document, which becomes part of your procedure, in addition to the actual content in it? So this is just that example of how you have a piece of paper, you follow the requirements, you filled it out and you handed it over to the auditor and they're coming back with a thousand more questions. And it just is really, really difficult to stay up with, you know, why isn't this document enough, even though it's meeting that requirement. And so this comes into my next tip here, which is give the auditor the piece that they, you know that they need to know, which is what is your management process around that document? Maybe it's a, if you're using Word, you know, just do an introduction, right? The date, time, stamp on your document. Who's the owner of that process? How frequently do people meet to review the poem? And, you know, who is bringing a new item onto the poem? How do you manage um, delays or, or um, conflicts of interest or other things that might affect actually, you know, doing the action items. And it's risk management, right? So you might even fold that into other processes you have around CUI and non-CUI risk management activities. So just anticipate somebody unfamiliar with your processes has to pick up your poem and figure it out and how difficult that might be. So you just might even have somebody in another department read it and say, you know, does this make sense to you and see what kind of questions they come back with. You can kind of anticipate how an auditor is tackling all of that. So 
when we get to the system secure plan, what we see is this is the NIST 800-171. How nice is that? The template actually lists out each of the controls, gives you the definition of what the control structure should be. And then you have these you know, columns where you can start to fill out how you've actually implemented it. So this is that key control that the auditor is you know, finally getting their hands on, right? getting names of systems, the definition of where the CUI boundaries are. And my, my you know, organization um, as an auditor, I, I look at that, I look to see how complete it is, I look to see how thorough people are filling it out, and I wanna connect it to upstream and downstream processes, right? So just like your poem, you wanna make sure that as a system secure plan, you have something in there that explains who's the owner of that document, how frequently is it reviewed, um, and of course, uh, testing against it, right? Because once you've defined your control, the auditor's looking for evidence of the control in place and working effectively. And so you can help the auditor and your organization as well, connecting this also to your poem, right? So you can start to cross-reference controls in your system secure plan back to your plan of action so you have this one-two punch about how you're managing risks across your organization. So let's come back to auditors again. So that system secure plan is technically just your CUI side of the house, but you also are starting to realize that it also has to touch on your business controls. And inside the NIST 800-171 control areas, you'll realize that there's a lot of wording that does address all. And it's important to realize the scope of all is not just your CUI, all of your CUI systems, but starting to look at your whole business process. How is it able to prove that things on the CUI side are not ever coming out to the non-CUI side, the clean and the dirty side of the house? And it's really helpful that you're, you know, just to understand and anticipate how auditors have to do that. They have to not only validate everything that we said is inside the CUI, but think about it, they're gonna walk into your building and if it's a room inside your building, they now have to inspect it and get a sense that something can't come out of that controlled area. And if the, if the employees that are CUI employees, right, have two roles in there, you know, how do you, how do you evidence that nothing is walking into the room or walking out of the room, right? It becomes an incredibly uh, complex situation that might have some systematic uh, you know, and digital controls that need to be in place in addition to just that physical control. So just anticipate that. And now that we have a peek under the covers about how um, the auditors are looking at information, you can now come back to your system and start to clarify there, right? Because they're talking about your whole organization, not just the pieces where CUI is. They're, they want to know that, but they also want to know how integrated you are to other systems. And now you also have another peek in here to realize that this is also talking about the subcontractors and your ripple effect, right? So all of your third parties and vendors. So while your contracts might state there's no CUI in here, uh, now you've got to come back to the auditor's point of view. All right, so how do I get comfort that no CUI data is actually accidentally uh, or unintentionally somehow being transmitted where it's not needing to be. And they have to validate that. So they are tasked with figuring out where your controls are within your whole business process and very specifically for the subnet of your um, population that's related to CUI. So subcontractors, much like the cybersecurity NIST uh, program being a voluntary, this is also going to come into view. So while it's not specifically spelled out in this 800-171, it can be on the agenda for the auditors to talk about. And they're going to talk about that because of the dependencies. And it mirrors what the DOD's dependencies is for the contractors, where if the contractor has good security security controls, now they have a dependency on a subcontractor to not be their security weak link. And so it's also making sure that vendors have good management controls over their uh, subcontractors. You could almost say NIST 800-171 is going to be applicable down the line. So not only are they going to do the flow down look to see that CUI is a part of that subcontracting relationship, they have to understand what other dependencies you have on other vendors and subcontractors. And it's those same boundaries, right? 
How are you doing a vendor management list? How are you tracking who on your list is a CUI related contract and a non CUI related contract? They're going to map that back to your controls, right? They have to validate both sides of that house. And it's important to start to ask yourself, you know, what happens um, if your subcontractor has a, a, a breach or uh, if they're, um, somehow their network is compromised, right? You might have, uh, you know, an interesting kind of connectivity or relationship to your subcontractor. And so you're guilty by association. And DFARS is really, really clear. It's up to the contractor to validate or certify that their subcontractors are compliant. They're not going to do that work for you, but they are going to look at your process to manage it. And so it also becomes a moment where you can start to ask yourself, do I have all the pieces of information around my CUI subcontractors? Do I have a clear definition in all of my contracts and in my vendor management that none of my subcontractors are CUI, right? So that it's really clear. Now the auditor just focuses to see that the data stays inside, right? It's not expected to transmit in some way. And remember that that's that. Uh, covered information system is process, transmit, or stores confidential and classified information. So it's, it's following that through its whole life cycle throughout your whole organization. So really start to sit down and say risk management, right? Have we thought this through every single contractor, every, sing, every single subcontractor, every single um, document that we have that, that uh, procedure that evidences how we've defined it? how we pass that through, how we train everybody on it. And think about some of the scenarios. What if your subcontractor who's managing CUI is actually breached? Now, they have a requirement to report up to the DOD, but do they have a requirement to report to you in the same time frame? You know, what if they report immediately to the DOD but not to you? And then the DOD comes knocking on your door because, of course, you're guilty by association. So you have to prove all this stuff, and you may not know the source of that being that your subcontractor was breached and maybe not breached and captured your data or, you know, related CUI data, but somebody else's, right? And so it becomes this important thing to realize how quickly uh, you could be accountable or, you know, in some ways responsible for the timeliness of getting informed, not only, you know, from having a breach occur, but your own processes and managing it and containing it. So just Go ahead and think through um, what your dependencies are and what else is happening there. All right, what else is expected, right? We already know that the, the cybersecurity is a voluntary now and is probably coming to be a permanent part of our lives, much like those credit cards, uh, PCI and DSS controls were voluntary, but now they're actually mandatory. Uh, think of your life cycle what's happening before, during, and after. Uh, think about your contract award. Uh, of course, uh, if you've already got a DOD contract, the SSP and the Palm have already been requested to be submitted. If you're wanting to get a, an award, you need to think through how you've implemented 800-171, how your evidence in it, and of course the SSP and the Palm to be presented. Uh, think through the um, the whole plan for the flow down, right? So you know maybe re-review your contracts, do your own mini testing. Um, just to get ready for that, because there's a lot of activities that are involved in that. And I know that was a lot to go through, and I went through it rather fast, but I appreciate your patience and listening to all of it. For any contractor or subcontractor that hasn't quite got it all in place, and, uh, you know, maybe looking for, like, how do I tackle this? Because it is a huge program, and, of course, there's more pieces coming. So we have seven steps that we think would help break that down into manageable and implementable steps. So the first one is just going back to that stage one, you know, locate it, right? Find all your systems in your whole organization. That's an asset management inventory system, your hardware, your software, the databases. Think of all the connectivity that you have and then really map that inventory to whether or not a CUI piece of data is processed, stored, or transmitted or connect to that in any way. 
Um, and then really think through where all the information, you know, travels in its uh, journey, you know, from inception to storage. Categorize it, not just your CUI data, but your non-CUI data. So it's really clear where those boundaries are and how the systems that manage those classifications are managing that as well. Uh, limit the access to it, not a surprise here, right? Access based on least privilege, but when you get to CUI, it's a hard and fast. You know, there are no exceptions kind of a thing. So it's really identifying how the CUI and the non-CUI side of the house are enforced. Encrypt shouldn't be a surprise, right? Confidential information, sensitive information must be encrypted throughout its whole life cycle. And that can be a challenge too, where you realize, you know, um, when you create the data item, at what point, right, does it get encrypted? Um, so it's really helpful. And of course, through the whole channel, to your subcontractors or anyone outside your organization. And then monitoring. An auditor is looking for that oversight. How do you know it's working? How do you know it's not working? And sometimes when an auditor reperforms evidence, they're trying to trip it, right? They're looking for the error message. They're looking for the lock out. And so they want to see that that created an alert and who got it and how timely, um, you know, a peek in or a remediation occurs. So Really think through, you know, your ticketing system, your alerting system, monitoring of your subcontractors, right? How frequently do we know what's going on in their world? Training all of your resources, not just your CUI resources, right? Because those boundaries are really important to maintain. So it's educating your whole organization on what is NIST 800-171? What is a controlled information system? How are these processes enforced? Your employees are your first and your last defense system. And then assess it. If you don't have an internal audit function, if you don't have a maybe a person, uh, like sometimes legal department can have a compliance function and they can do the assessment. Um, you might have a complementary role inside your IT systems that can do your security assessment. But think it through, right? Not just once a year, you know, do your own mini audit, but even assessing the effectiveness of all of your controls through your SSP, through your POEM processes, right? So you're looking for a continuous improvement process. Um, and of course, you can use an external party to come in and do that assessment for you, right? Because acting just like um, an Office of Inspector General or the DCAA or the DCMA, right? You could have someone else come in and follow that same audit procedure and just look at your documentation, do that interview process and do the observation and get some comfort on whether or not those controls are working as intended. Okay, so that is all that I had to offer today. Um, these resources are out there. They help you with where NIST has been defined, some of the audit programs, those test examples for the SSP and the POEM. So we offer that up to you as a short and sweet thing. And Nick, I'll hand it over to you to see if there's any questions. Okay, thank you. That was amazing. All right. Well, we actually have quite a few questions. Uh, I'll just start going through a list here. Uh, we'll try to get to every single one of these before uh, we're up on the hour, and we we'll, might go over a little bit if we need to, but uh, the, one of the first questions, what will a DCAA or DCMA audit look like? Oh, that's a really good question. So DCAA, Defense Contract Audit Agency, and DCMA, Defense Contract Management Agency. So. Those are actually looking at the contract itself, uh, which is a little different than what, say, the Office of Inspector General would look at as part of the um, uh, DOD. So the DCAA and DCMA are, are looking to review your security plan, the POEM. They're looking through, is there enough information there to get a comfort, if you will, that you've defined it? that you have uh, both uh, evidence that if they asked for it, it was available. They might ask for pieces of evidence. So they're more tabletop types of reviews rather than rigorous on-site audit, inspect, observe, and challenge. Your Office of Inspector General might come on site. Now, the other kind of trick with DCAA and DCMA is, as you can imagine, in 2019, they're gathering all of this information in. They're going to prioritize and risk assess, right? And then you could see that the schedule would be who do they come on site and do further testing for higher risk contractors and subcontractors. So how would that happen? 
if you don't have a SSP or a poem, if your information isn't complete or clear, uh, and if it's not um, understood how that control has been defined and implemented. So that comes into, it sounds simple enough, they're just asking for the document, but why from the audit process, it may not be sufficient. Perfect. Um, there is another one here. Oh, there's quite a few more actually. Uh, how long to implement a NIST 800-171? So that's probably more subjective to how organizations are um, organized and uh, how complex your systems are. I would always recommend start out with a six-month project plan uh, and then roll it into a, an ongoing and living process. And the key to that is if you haven't already defined your clean versus dirty sides of the Kui and non-Kui house, you need to start from ground one. That could take a little bit longer. And of course, if you're preparing to become a federal contractor or subcontractor, this is a good exercise for you. If you've got a little bit more maturity in your organization, you've defined it, you have inventories, you've classified it now you're really just clarifying all of your workflows and processes to line up to those 14 audit categories how your evidence is thoroughly defined so it could be you know probably a six month um, gig or longer but really think about it now just like those credit card companies and the merchants this is a living process this isn't a one-time event this now becomes how you do business and it looks like I have a few more that I could just read off in our Q&A here, Nick. Um, Perfect. Yeah, so let me just look at this. So if you submitted the SSP and POEM last year at the end of 2018, what is required as a deliverable this year and when? So that's a really good question. So the initial one is submitted, right? They'll review and get back to you. Um, it's not a requirement now to submit that every year, but I would say be prepared, right? Because as they go through getting all this data, prioritizing and risk assessing it, then they want to then come back and maybe do deep dives. And they might randomly do that, but they're most likely start with ones that haven't submitted, that have submitted, but they're incomplete and not there. Now, if you submitted last year and here we are in March and you start to look at what you submitted and you say, you know what? Uh, we kind of get this a little bit more and our current documentation's a bit clearer, a bit more complete. You can always resubmit it, right? That's a good evidence on view taking this seriously. It's a living document and it's current. So you don't, you know, it's not like that's uh, an incomplete uh, way to do that. So be ready because that way if you're asked, you can resubmit it and also anticipate that probably every year at some point, every year you're going to have to submit it because that's going to be the new requirement. And again, that's following what those credit card merchants um, or uh, credit card holders are doing with the um, those merchants. Now it's kind of part of doing business, a day in life in the business. So, um, so we have another one here that says, um, we purchased some documentation from a third party to help us maintain compliance. And it seems to me this document is just a repurposed version of their 853 document. So do all the 853 uh, controls apply um, uh, as non-federal contractors pretty far down the supply chain? Okay, that's a, that's a really good one. So here's, here's the short on that. Start with your SSP and realize that 853 is part of how that uh, SSP, those controls were, uh, you know, they kind of took all of 853 and summarized it for CUI data. So not all of 853 applies. Now, but if you've implemented 853, you're probably in great shape. But you still have to clarify, right, CUI and non-CUI. You still have to look at your, um, you know, flow down on your contractors. And you have the responsibility now for that dependency. If you have CUI going to any subcontractor, that you have to do that vendor management, contract management, and, of course, security management with them. So it's a good place to start. I would say 853 is a larger, more in-depth program. And so that's why your SSP and um, 800-171 is much more manageable than that. So you're right. You just have to do the 800-171, and using that big program is probably overkill and not giving you the clarification that you have. Um, and so we also have another question. So if the poem is deliverable, 
and it's a living document, then are resubmissions required? And the answer is no. The answer is whenever the auditor comes on site and, and asks you for your poem, they're going to review it to see that it's current and that you have a recurring process, right? You don't just create the poem in January of 2019 and never touch it again. It's that they're going to see that, uh, yes, you have recurring, maybe quarterly or regularly processes, and you have a, a method to put stuff on the poem, review it, keep people accountable to completing those activities. Uh, so they're looking at how you use that poem as part of your risk management. And you'll notice that, like, again, um, that I question about submitting it. Um, and then do we resubmit it every year? At some point, yeah. And they're going to look to see, you know, the frequency of the poem being um, updated, the completeness, clarity, and um, the, the use of that poem as part of your process to manage your risk. All right, so let's see here. There's, there's, we have a question here that also wants you to look at a PDF. Um, what I would like to do, uh, the participant's name is Frank. I don't want to give that any more information. Uh, what I'm thinking is maybe we have a look at that. Um, and Frank, if you're still listening, please, um, can you send us an email, your email address at info at braintrace.com. Um, and we'll have Kate take a look at that and she can respond directly back to you on that one. And I'll just say that really quickly now. Um, so that, that, uh, so I'll just restate the question, which says, um, the requirement in, uh, what, uh, DFARS is saying is that it is the contractor's responsibility to state whether or not they're in compliance with 800-171. That is exactly right. And the point is that mirrors what those credit card companies and merchants had in that relationship before. It's voluntary now. You do your own self-assessment. And this is where this webinar is to help you realize, be your own auditor, because you're going to submit your own self-assessment in 2019, 2018. In Next year, they're going to maybe put you on the list to come out and do a deeper dive. So your self-assessment is only probably for a couple of grace years, um, but don't be surprised as you submit it if they kind of pull that up and want to then um, do a um, review or an audit or maybe follow with some additional questions. So while we're all in that happy moment of just handing them that documentation and whew, that's done, um, just start to realize that this is a, this is a process that's going to come back. It's going to get more formalized. We already know cybersecurity and subcontractors are probably going to get folded into version two, version three, and um, it's going to, you know, it's here to stay. So start getting that familiarity about um, being prepared to ask for that document. Ask yourself, do you have that ability to say, I did a self-assessment, and yes, I am comfortable, like an auditor would be, that those controls are in place and working as effectively. And then, um, and so that's, that's all I have. Uh, another one here, uh, what if I, what is, the, what, what is the consequences of failing an audit? Well, that's, almost a subjective question. I think the uh, end consequence uh, of failing uh, a NIST audit or NIST 800-171 would be that the DOD doesn't have comfort that those controls are in place. So you would, you know, not be a contractor. You would lose your contract. We all probably have heard those rumors. That's what kind of spurred us into 800-171. Again, those ripple effects for dependencies and risks. A lot of contractors not having sufficient security controls in place, not having complete processes to manage those controls. So probably your worst case scenario is you lose the contract. You might have something um, in between that, which is they might give you a remediation program saying, okay, here's here's NIST 800-171, here's our level of comp competence in that, and then they might come back and audit you every year until they get a comfort that you actually get it, have sufficient controls, and are working on it. Some of this could be that complexity about the kind of contract that you have with them, and so you probably are in some um, process of discussing with them about um, how you could remediate, how you could actually um, resolve uh, any of the gaps or assessments that they felt were not adequate. Um, so uh, another question out there is this, uh, you don't have a system secure plan or a plan of action and milestones. Um, Obviously, that's the two key requirements for NIST to, to submit up. And so I would say, if you don't have them, get them ready. 
Um, and if you don't submit them timely, you could probably anticipate being on that short list, if you will, um, to be either uh, approached for an audit or at least from um, the DCAA to submit them within a certain time frame. And if you, of course, miss that time frame, that's probably the process that you're going to go down in terms of um, losing your contract or, or having some other uh, consequence. All right, so I'm just looking through here. There's kind of, hey, uh, if we have any more questions, it's, there's going to be probably some more questions coming through. Um, what we'll do is we'll actually be addressing those uh, as well. Uh, we might even actually be doing another webinar, hopefully, actually, uh, kind of a part two in a sense. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to close this up. Again, uh, we're going to, uh, you know, we'll be responding to some questions as well uh, via email. Um, but in, anyway, what I want to do is I want to thank everyone for joining us. And if you have any further questions, please do feel free to just email us at info at braintrace.com. Uh, we'll be monitoring those uh, and uh, getting back to everyone as soon as possible. Uh, and if your organization would like Braintrace to help with getting ready for an audit or any, any, any other additional services, please feel free to call us at 866-508-5471. Or you can also find us at braintrace.com. We are always happy to help. Thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon.